Hey everyone, welcome to Data Engineers Lunch. We'll give everyone another minute or two to file in and we'll go ahead, go ahead and get started shortly. Everyone will give everyone another minute or so to file in and we'll go ahead and get started soon. Alrighty, let's go ahead and cut the music. We'll go ahead and get started. Hey everyone, welcome to Data Engineers Launch number 64. Uh, today's topic is gonna be on pr processing real-time crypto transactions. Today's guest speaker is Eric Sammer, CEO of Decodable. Uh, link is below in the description if you wanna go ahead and check it out. Um, today's, uh, or the co-organizers for this event are Rahul and myself. Uh, we are looking for guest speakers or sponsors. If you wanna, if you're interested in uh, giving a talk at Data Engineers Lunch or Sister Lunch, Cassandra Lunch, feel free to reach out to me. My email is listed below. If you're all also interested in sponsoring Data Engineers Lunch or Cassandra Lunch, you can also reach out to me below. We're, we are a part of Data Community DC. Data Community DC be believes in building an inclusive environment. So no matter your race, gender, sexual orientation, everyone is welcome and we expect the respect to be given to all. Data Community DC has built up a bunch of different organizations. Um, our event falls under Data Wranglers DC. Super interested in all the various events under Data Community DC. You can find out more at datacommunitydc.org. So what do we cover here at Data Engineers Lunch? We cover everything that is data engineering, uh, data cleansing, ETL, um, data wrangling, um, the ingress to egress of data and all the tools and processes that happen in all of the, uh, um, the umbrella of data engineering. Uh, if you're new here, say hi, hello, what do you do with engineer, data engineering? Uh, if you wanna learn about a certain topic or if you wanna give a talk on something you've done, maybe with an experience, or if you wanna pick up a tool and then talk about it as well, you can reach out to me, my email is listed below. Uh, group rules, if you have a question, ask it. Uh, please be polite and courteous to others. Uh, the guest speaker may have preferences and when they prefer questions. So when we hand it over to them, they'll clarify their preferences. And again, this is meant to be a community. So please do share what you know with us. Uh, if you know, have 
uh, knowledge on a topic um, or you want to learn more about the topic, feel free to speak up and ask questions. Uh, here at Anant, we design, build, and manage global real-time data analytic analytics platforms surrounding Cassandra, Spark, and Kafka. So data engineering is a way of life for us. DataStax is a partner and a sponsor. GW University helps provide venue space when we have in-person events. We also have some institutional and organizational sponsors. If anyone has any job offerings or is looking for a job, or if they have any meetups, hackathons, or conferences that they would like to promote, feel free to drop links uh, to and from um, below as well, and we can then transfer to and from. DataSax Astra currently has a build-a-thon ongoing. Uh, the first two months, I believe, are wrapping up, so the third month is currently ongoing. Uh, if you qualify as one of the top three winners for the third month, you qualify to present your ideas on demo day. So there's cash and swag prizes to be won for uh, the month as well as the demo day. Um, so if you're interested, check it out. We'll drop the link below. Uh, Anant is hiring full-time and part-time positions, data platform operators, engineer architects. You can find out more at careers.anant.us. Um, we hold data engineers lunch every Mondays at 12 p.m. Eastern, and we have our sister lunch, Cassandra lunch on Thursdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Again, we are looking at a more variable time slot so we could have live videos to the whole world. But again, all these videos directly stream directly to YouTube. So they are available in uh, as soon as they're done as well as, as they're ongoing. So don't forget to like and subscribe so you can keep up to date. And with that, we will go ahead and pass it over to our guest speaker for today, um, Eric. Thanks so much, Arpan. I really appreciate it. And it's, uh, it's really exciting to give it a chance to talk to all of you. These kinds of events are like lifeblood to me. I think um, being able to talk to people, whether they're sort of people building the actual data infrastructure or people using that infrastructure, you know, you, you don't get a lot of those kinds of opportunities as a vendor, you know, so I, I am an evil vendor these days. So like, you know, those, those kinds of things are great. I want to thank Anant for, for, uh, for hosting us today. Um, really, really exciting to get a chance to, to talk to all of you. I'm going to talk to all of you today and I have exactly zero slides because if I were you, I wouldn't want to look at slides. Um, I want to talk to you mostly about real-time data engineering. And so, you know, at Decodable, you know, you know, our elevator pitches that we make, you know, real-time data engineering easy for, for mere mortals. And so really what that means is we provide a, uh, a cloud platform to be able to connect to all kinds of data sources and destinations or sinks, build pipelines in SQL, um, and we handle sort of all the low level guts around uh, job parallelization and query planning and execution and, and all the other sort of like gory details that go into stream processing. So if you're using something like, um, like Kafka, or Apache Pulsar, Red Panda, Kinesis, any of the sort of like bread and butter uh, event streaming systems, we can connect to those. If you're using database systems and object stores like S3 and those kinds of things, we could also connect to some of those as sort of a growing list of connectors. We don't even do proprietary formats uh, and things like that. So if you're you know, already onboarding your data into, again, Kafka or Pulsar, you basically have full access to that whole ecosystem of open source connectors, whether it's from Kafka Connect or you know, vendor specific connectors uh, for different pieces of technology. And then Decodable can sort of process that data in, in real time. Under the hood, um, Decodable is, uh, is using a bunch of open source tech to power the stack. And specifically, the place we spend most of our time is with Apache Flink. Um, and uh, I know Arpin mentioned Spark. You know, we, we've wound up doing quite a bit of work with Apache Flink only because of its, um, its guarantees and semantics and its sort of purpose built for those stream processing use cases. So all of this stuff around stateful stream processing and job recovery and exactly once processing and, and so on and so forth, we have found Flink to be the right technology for us and to build the rest of Decodable on top of. Um, I'm going to be, uh, I'm not gonna give you sort of like a big commercial for, for Decodable. I really wanna talk about the use case around processing financial transactions. So we're gonna use crypto transactions coming from data PM, which I think uh, Travis presented to all of you last time. And so I'm gonna sort of pick up the thread there and show you some of the stuff that you can do on those crypto transactions 
using data PM and, and decodable, but really it should be generally applicable. And in fact, even beyond just crypto, uh, the, the kind of stuff that we're going to talk about today is really applicable to, you know, more traditional finance events like fixed data streams and those kinds of things. Or you could imagine just about any kind of time series or event uh, based stream where you can sort of perform these kinds of operations. So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the way in which uh, we have built decodable more so than decodable itself um, and why we think that's interesting and some of the guarantees that that provides and then talk about sort of the ways that you can use that kind of system and why we think that that's interesting. Um, as for questions, I love them. You know, so please feel free to type them into chat, uh, you know, here in, in Zoom. I think you can also do that. We have folks monitoring YouTube uh, live, so you can, you can ask questions there. Um, or if you're, if you're on the Zoom, feel free to unmute yourself and just interrupt me. Uh, bear with me if I, if I defer to you and, you know, maybe we come back to something in the future, but I think for the most part, um, I love I love taking questions in the moment. That way, we don't we don't lose track of them or forget them. Um, so I'm going to be inside of the decodable application today, and mostly just using this to sort of show you the different pieces and sort of how we think about the problem. You know, whether you're interested in decodable specifically or not, it at least will give you a little bit of grounding in sort of how, like I said, how we think about the problem. Um, Decodable has a couple of different interfaces. I'm looking at the application here. There's also like a command line interface. And in fact, maybe I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, and REST API is uh, for sort of programming, you know, the connections, the streams and the pipelines. Um, Decodable is a cloud service. And so we actually have a number of, you know, you can have multiple accounts. It's in a specific cloud provider and a cloud region. Um, and so in this case, I'm operating out of US West 2 in AWS. Um, and you can see that I have multiple accounts here, but I'm, I'm in my Eric test one account where I have, you know, some of the examples, uh, set up and running today. Before we jump into specific examples, just to give you some, some level set, everything we do is in the context of pipelines, streams, and connections. So connections are, um, exactly what they sound like. This is what bridges external third-party systems to the inside of decodable and it mostly has everything that you think it does so connections are either sources or sinks we have a bunch of different kinds of, of connectors each of which for instance like pulsar will ask you for uh technology specific information authentication tokens topic names you know, formats of the event payloads, you know, within a particular topic. Um, whereas something like Confluent Cloud, which is really some icing and sugar around Kafka that knows how to do things like discover uh, broker topics and, and schema registries and those kinds of things um, that has a lot of the same uh, information. Um, and so we have a bunch of these different things on the sync side. There, you know, a lot of these are symmetric. So obviously Kafka, Confluent Cloud, Pulsar, Red Panda can all be used as sources or sinks. Um, and then we have certain things like, um, you know, Postgres uh, as a sync or S3 that are a little bit more specific to, um, you know, to a particular uh, destination rather than a, than a source. And so these support things like partitioning of data and, you know, layout for, uh, things like Athena to be able to query and so on and so forth and, and supports, you know, different formats like uh, Apache Parquet or JSON or basically uh, new line, new line term related text. Um, so when I say connection, just know that it can be any, any source or any destination really. Um, all of these connections and here for today, um, the integration between data PM and decodable is actually using decodable's REST API. And so this works mostly the way you think it does. Data PM can basically post um, uh, an array of JSON objects and those will effectively be ingest into, uh, into decodable. There isn't a lot of configuration uh, for the REST connector. In fact, it's really just a, an endpoint. And then, you know, JSON is the only, you know, reasonable format there. 
Um, but just know that connections in Decodable are attached to streams, whether, you know, if it's a source connection like this, it's going to have an outbound stream. You know, if it's a sync connection, it's going to have an inbound stream. Um, and similarly, we take a pretty opinionated view of the world because we are based around SQL. All of our data types and those kinds of things are expressed as SQL data types. So you hear like I'm using uh, strings and doubles, and you know I think we use timestamps and decimals and those kinds of things later on in this demo. Um, but just know that this will allow us to do things like shed malformed events and those kinds of things at the source. Excuse me, or you know um, uh, at least you know pause the pipeline or the connection if. Uh, we receive malformed data in certain cases. So certain connectors have different sort of error handling and failure strategies. I'm not gonna get a ton into that, but if folks have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, connections and pipelines are either active or inactive. Um, and so you see that this connection is in a running state. It has a stop button. You know, uh, I can, of course, edit it. In this case, it's created by data PM. I'll sort of show you that a little bit later. Um, and like I said, it's bound to this output connection. So anything that receives that we receive on this Rust connection is going to go to the stream. And streams are passive in that they're they're kind of always running. They're they're under the hood. They're actually backed by Kafka topics, right? To give you some idea about how this works in the hood. Um, and so this stream, you can see, has an inbound from one connection, has an outbound to one pipeline. Um, and I'll show you the pipeline in just a sec. And the stream has a schema. And in this case, um, it, it matches that of the connection. And the reason why we separate connection from stream is because many connections can write to or read from a stream. So this is the place where we do things like fan in or fan out. Um, now the schemas do have to match and we will validate that we will basically stop you from connecting things that are incompatible um uh in fact we do as little magic like translation or type transformation and those conversion those kinds of things between streams and connections because what we want to do is push all of that to pipelines so that all of your processing is in one place rather than spread through a bunch of these different objects so sometimes that feels a little tedious because you're like, well, why do I have to define this, the, the schema twice? And in most cases you don't, when you create a connection, we can auto create a stream for you and those kinds of things. So we try and make it as easy as possible, but we, we do create the separation. The other reason we create the separation is because in a lot of teams, there's actually a very small group of people who know about a source system or a target system. So like Arvin mentioned like Cassandra or something like that. You might be the only person on your team who knows how to connect to Cassandra or has the right to have the credentials to connect to Cassandra. And so once you create that connection and expose a stream for other people to use, the people who are building pipelines never need the credentials anymore. And so we have separated, um, you know, uh, we have separated the, uh, you know, the, the roles of the different users. Um, so uh, this is super important in large organizations where, you know, you, you need that kind of a separation for compliance purposes or where the, the credentials are sensitive. And we think that this actually is the right sort of, um, the right sort of abstraction. We have a couple of questions from YouTube chat. Um, how are you doing CDC and Postgres? What a deep and exciting conversation. Um, so the short answer is that streams, we haven't exposed all of this yet. So to be really, really transparent with all of you, we have mostly been working with what we would call append only streams rather than change streams. And so um, in a lot of cases, like the Postgres connector you see today will basically only do inserts, right? It's, it's purpose built for sort of being able to append tables. Um, CDC is a different animal or change data capture is a different animal. So in that case, what we are doing right now is that we are going to modify streams that be either append only or carry a chain stream, which is basically a, a CDC stream. 
And if you're super familiar with this stuff, you can think about like the Debezium format and those kinds of things. If you're not, basically, you know, append only streams carry like your event, whereas in the CDC stream, they carry a sort of special kind of event that says this is an insert, an update, a delete, you know, there's some I'm paving over some of the complexity, but like there, there's more to it than that. And then the before record and the after record. And so basically you can know what has changed and how it has changed. Um, and then downstream processing can apply those changes either to another database system or in the case of something like Declaredable can create things like materialized views for joins and those kinds of things. Um, and, and so uh, we will be adding CDC sources and a, a version of the sync that understands how to interpret change uh, events. And then we'll add another level of, of type checking so that not only do we require uh, uh, schemas to match, but we'll also prevent you from attaching like a, an append only sort uh, a sync to a change stream and like those kinds of things. So there's, there's some details that we're working through today, but that's how we're, we're planning on handling uh, CDC data. Um, and there will be stuff inside of decodable, like again, the primary use case is joint table and materialization. So basically creating a table uh, that represents current state from like a database table or something like that so that you can join streaming data with uh, reference data. So think, you know, IP address to MAC address mapping and security use cases or user profile data, those kinds of things. And will we use Kafka? So internally, like I said, our streams are backed by Kafka topics. The truth of the matter is we actually don't care. We currently use Kafka because we know it very well. We've also uh, have quite a bit of experience with Pulsar, which we also like a whole lot. And now there's things like Red Panda, which I think are really exciting to keep an eye on. Um, you know, we know that team pretty well. We're fans of that te technology, um, but mostly, all we really need is a messaging system that um, is horizontally scalable, mostly through partitioning um, and preserves uh, ordering within partitions. The rest of Decodable mostly doesn't care. We do some, uh, we have some smarts around Kafka to sort of replay that stuff, but the sources that you create your connections to can be any kind of messaging system or you know, in the future database system uh, to, to be able to handle that. Um, great questions, deep topic. There's a lot more to it that I'm, I'm sort of uh, skipping over, but keep them coming. Um, so like I said, streams have this schema, they allow fan in, fan out. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll sort of move along in the interest of time. The, uh, and, and I should add, the reason we keep these streams is so that we can sort of manage things like back pressure and replay and downtime of pipelines. Basically, if you stop a pipeline, we can keep the connection running, it'll buffer in the stream, and then we can sort of start and stop the pipeline without having to worry about data loss and those kinds of things, because we don't know that we can apply back pressure to the upstream sources, for instance. Like if they are Kafka or Pulsar or something like that, then we can do that. If, it, if it's other kinds of systems like the REST API, we basically have a fixed amount of time in which we have to respond to those, uh, to those kinds of requests. Um, and then finally, we have pipelines and pipelines are actually really simple. You know, we will ask you, you know, choose an input stream, you know, this is gonna be the source of the pipeline. And so here, for instance, if I chose like Coinbase transactions, you can choose an output stream or you can skip it. And then basically you're gonna get a SQL editor. Um, and again, in our command line tools, you can like version control all this stuff. Our pipelines are version, but if you want to store them in like Git and GitHub and GitLab and those kinds of things, you can do that too. Um, and every pipeline is always expressed as an insert into the output stream, select whatever from the input stream. Um, and then you can browse, you know, the, the catalog of sort of the available fields if you forget what's, what's, uh, what's present, or you can look at sort of your, your um, your output uh, stream. In this case, the uh, decodable smart enough to actually look at the schema and sort of know what the output schema will be and derive that from the from the SQL query. Um, this is similar to like a create table as select, um, you know, in in certain database systems. 
uh, we use insert into rather than create because this could already exist and the semantics of that are sort of more applicable. Um, and you can do things like run previews. You can, uh, like I said, auto create the output. If we deselect this, this will actually throw an error if I try and do it, um, you know, uh, those kinds of things. So this sort of has uh, everything that you would expect. But in a lot of cases, we see people wanting to edit these kinds of SQL statements in like their editor of choice, VS Code. Uh, you know, if you're an old school person like myself, it's, it's Vim um, or, or IntelliJ or something like that. And then uh, version control those and, and apply them using the command line tool. Uh, we have another question from YouTube chat. Is this specific to decodable or is it a variant of Apache Flink SQL? What a great question. Um, it's actually mostly uh, Apache Flink SQL. There are a couple of things that we do to constrain the dialect to the subset that we think makes sense. Like as a, for instance, we require that the SQL statement be inserted into select from um, in, in this particular view. So we don't allow arbitrary SQL. Um, and that's mostly so we can do type checking and validation and those kinds of things to make sure that you don't build pipelines that, excuse me, that don't work. Um, so for instance, you can't say, you know, select foo, you know, um, and try and do this. This is probably going to, yeah, column foo is not found in the table. So, you know, these kinds of things are things that we will sort of do the type checking around. Um, all of the functions, all of the operators that you get access to as part of uh, Apache Flink, if you're aware of Flink, um, you can use those directly. There are a bunch of optimizer tricks that we sort of have inserted to um, optimize certain specific use cases because we know about the, we're not as general purpose as Flink. Like we, we know what the sources are. We know what the destinations are. Um, we're only speaking SQL. There isn't imperative code in there. So we are actually able to take some shortcuts, um, especially around things like select star and like some of those other kinds of things. Um, and obviously you don't have to do any of the Flink catalog DDL type stuff because the decodable catalog of streams and connections and pipelines is actually stepping in and sort of fulfilling that. But under the hood, that's what we're actually doing. We're programming the, the you know, Flink catalog and doing a bunch of other stuff that, that happens there um, at, at runtime. Um, so that gives you some idea of what a pipeline is. And so here, you know, maybe sort of jumping into the examples, um, and in fact, I am going to start up a, um, a data PM command. And so I'm pulling data from, I've, I've pre-configured this a little bit, from the Coinbase tickers uh, uh, data set, which is a real-time streaming data set coming from Coinbase that has basically all of the, uh, the uh, ticker transactions. Um, I'm syncing to Decodable. I have my eSummer test one account. Um, and uh, Data PM has already created my input streams um, and uh, configured the data types and stuff like that. So here, um, I'm just going to select uh, the Bitcoin to USD stream. And I'm going to select the ETH to uh, USD stream. Uh, whoops, just, well, um, just so that we have a little bit of data. And in terms of credentials, I have a couple of different profiles. Decodable has different, basically, account profiles, sort of like Amazon or GitHub and those kinds of things where you can switch between different accounts. So I'm going to use my eSAM or test one. It's going to test the credentials. In this case, it finds the stream that it wants to write to based on naming conventions. It finds the connection, which is the REST connection. Um, and uh, the connection's already running because I had run this once before. Um, and it's going to start streaming the data. So if I flip back over to Decodable and I look at this cleansing pipeline, um, we can see, so just to show you what the SQL looks like, all I'm doing is basically transforming this Coinbase transaction feed the way I want to see it. Um, and so basically what I'm doing is I'm changing the timestamp 
um, and, and taking it from a string format and parsing it as an RFC 3336 timestamp, I think it is, um, and renaming it TX time. Um, type is a reserved word in SQL. So I just want to rename that. So I'm calling that TX type. And then there's a bunch of casting of just like taking the sequence and, you know, making it a big int. Um, product ID, I don't modify it all. And then a bunch of these things come in as doubles. I'm casting them to decimals. They could be data PM now it has support for things like, you know, pulling these in as strings and sort of parsing them correctly. So like, let don't make any trades based on this math that I'm doing here, but like you get the idea. Um, and so I'm converting these to different, uh, different uh, data size, uh, data types, stuff like that. Um, and so I'm pulling this in from the Coinbase ticker stream that uh, data PM created, and I'm writing the result into this cleansed, you know, or sort of transformed, cleaned up Coinbase exchange transactions stream that I created. And in fact, I can run a preview here. This takes a second because it will parse and plan and then deploy those pipe, uh, basically a preview version of the, of the pipeline. And as data comes in from data PM, we'll actually start to see some of the results here. Um, let me just format these so they're a little bit easier to read. And so you can tell that I have, you know, um, them, they're sort of cleaned up the way that I would like to see them. And we show them in this, you know, JSON like format, but in fact, under the hood, they're, they're in a format that is sort of amenable for space efficiency and, and all sorts of detail. Um, so you can see sort of all the different, uh, you know, this is a Bitcoin to USD, it's a cell, you know, you can see sort of all the different um, fields that are coming from data PM. And in fact, uh, this is the uh, the data set that I'm using inside of data PM. So you can actually try this yourself. You, know, you can you can do this on your own um, and sort of play around with it if you want. Um, and so basically all of this data is going to flow in and inside of Decodable, you can see that some of the metrics are tip it, ticking in, in real time. These will update once every couple of seconds. Um, we have our input metrics, so bytes per second, records per second, total. Um, and this is actually total since the last time I activated it. This is, we probably need to read this. Um, and then the output metrics. And you can see because this is um, like a one-to-one -one pipeline, it's just transforming data, the records in and records out are, are uh, you know, are basically going to uh, be the same. The rates might be slightly different because of you know, timing about when we take the samples and, and those kinds of things to understand throughput. But you, know, you can sort of use this to know, is my data flowing uh, and those kinds of things. And you can see that we have some lineage you know, information here about uh, where the data is coming from and where it's going to. So receiving inbound from one stream, it's Coinbase tickers, one uh, ticker. Um, and that's, we've parsed and extracted that from the uh, the SQL statement that has been written, and we're outputting to uh, a single stream, which is the Coinbase transaction. And in fact, we can sort of navigate this, so I can sort of go one in this direction. So now I'm looking at the stream, um, and you can see this was auto created, you know, as an output, you know, from the cleanse pipeline. It has some more lineage information, so it's receiving from that one pipeline, and it's being used by another pipeline, which I'll show you in a second. And you can see its schema. And this is where you have things like, you know, the output schema from my from the cleansing pipeline that I that I showed you. So now TX time is a timestamp. Um, you can see we have some big ins, we have some decimals, um, so on and so forth. And finally, I want to talk about sort of event time. So like if you've ever done anything with streaming, event time is a pain in the butt. It's very confusing to a lot of people. It gets into like this whole huge discussion about late arriving data and those kinds of things. We try and make this as simple as possible for people. And so basically when you define the stream, you tell us which field um, carries the, uh, represents the, the actual time of the event. And so in this case, there's only one field that can 
because of the uh, the data type. And in this case, you know, it has to be a timestamp type. Um, and then you tell us the max lateness, which is, you know, under the hood uh, can be very, very complex. Um, so here we're basically not allowing data. When we receive a transaction time, basically that we, at that point, we will ignore anything that we get that is effectively out of order. Um, and it's even more complex than that. I'm not gonna get into a ton of detail here, um, but if we wanted to have some tolerance for late arriving data, you know, we could, we could have sort of, um, you know, some expression here. For those of you who do know Flink, um, you can actually use the low level watermark expression. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're, if you're sort of really, really smart uh, about Flink details, you can say, you know, TX time as TX time minus, you know, uh, what is it? I always get the syntax wrong. Is it one second? Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, this is really just sort of like a, a slightly nicer interface over the, you know, the, the, the flank watermark expression. So most people don't come to Decodable because they're sort of like deep flank experts. And so this is sort of the right way. All pipelines that use this stream, and in this case, this one Coinbase TX one second aggregation, are going to inherit that information about event time. And so for most people, this kind of paves over some of the complexity with respect to stream processing. And of course, there are ways you can sort of trick things and do all sorts of creative things if you really, really know what you're doing, but this is mostly the right answer. So now we have our cleansed data. We saw the output, it looks right. We're seeing Coinbase transactions for you know, Bitcoin flowing through the system. I've created another pipeline um, called Coinbase transaction one second aggregate. Um, and that's my sort of silly naming, but um, and you can see that there's data flowing here. This is the where the SQL really gets interesting. So now we've cleaned up um, and sort of transformed the data the way we would like to see it. And for what it's worth, everybody else at our company who wants to see it, they can also create these pipelines off of that clean stream if they want. Um, this is a slightly more complicated pipeline and it uses a bunch of stream processing tricks that I think are sort of interesting for the discussion here. So if you're not a SQL aficionado, the way we read these things is from the innermost query to the outermost query. So like you start with the simple stuff, you know, at the inner side here, we are, um, and this is where the, the streaming sort of magic starts to happen. So we are, we are reading from the Coinbase transaction, the exchange transaction stream, which you saw, and we're creating a tumbling window, which is a window that basically takes, in this case, a one second chunk and then advances by one second. So you can think about each window is one second wide and then shifts by one second. There are also things like sliding windows that can have a different size and slide interval. We support all those kinds of things. Um, but in this case, we're keeping it simple. So every second, we are going to um, take the count of transactions that have happened, the min price, max price, and average price as aggregates. And we're going to aggregate them by the window time, which I'll get back to in a second, the product ID, which in this data set is going to be the Bitcoin to USD or, or you know, whatever sort of, you know, uh, product, you know, someone is, is transaction someone's making at Coinbase. And then the side, which is either buy or sell. Um, so we can sort of know whether people, like what people are buying, what people are selling by sort of effectively, you know, uh, 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 crypto product. And we're actually going to filter it where the product is only Bitcoin to USD and the side is only buys. So like in this case, we're saying like, just as an example, like that's what we want. So we're gonna group by all those things. Now these three fields, window start, end and time are special. Um, 
when you use a tumble window, you automatically get these or a slide window, any kind of window function, you automatically get these fields. The window start is the, you know, the left hand side of the window. Right, so at a one second interval, that left hand side is going to move once a second. The window end is what you think it is. It's the right hand side of that window, and it's also going to move once a second and sort of advance to the right. Once it's going to move once a second by one second. Window time is special. That's the actual time that the Flink window was triggered, um, and we use we project this through the query so that we can use it later in an analytic window function. And I'll sort of get into that in a second. But for now, if we actually take this query, and here I'll, I'll show you the, um, oh, my example exited. I'm gonna start my example back up. Uh, let's look for Bitcoin to USD. Sometimes I think Coinbase shuts this off. <laughs> Sometimes Coinbase shuts this down. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run decodable. And in fact, you can see that I can say pipelines list and oh, pipeline list. I'm going to see the exact same pipeline. So this basically has all the same information that the UI does. In this case, I'm going to run a pipeline preview from the command line. And I'm going to paste my inner query so that I can see what it looks like. And so what I should get out of this um, is I'm going to get a record approximately once every second. You're going to see the window start, window end, window time, product ID, all the other fields that we're that we're selecting, uh, you know, from this data set, and they're going to be grouped up. And it's going to take a second because it actually has to create some of those. Uh, it actually has to create those windowed, um, windowed results. Um, in fact, let's make sure this is. Oh, it is running. Okay, so um, so here you can see these things are sort of ticking. I'm going to just uh, stop this for a sec. So let's see. Here we have a window start of 5 to 16, 42, 41. So uh, 41, and you can see the window end is 42, 42. Um, Hitchhiker Guide to the Galaxy magic number is happening here. So, um, so it's a one second start end. And you can see during that time, there were five transactions on the buy side for Bitcoin to USD. And you can see the price minimum, you can see the price average, you can see the price max, and the of the transactions within that window. Um, and you know, so so we're getting aggregated data um, on a one second basis from Coinbase. So the next query inside of this, this is where it gets slightly more interesting. We're going to take all those fields, but we are also going to use an analytic uh, uh, window function and take the lag. Now, this is like where like your brain needs to like sort of like rotate by 90 degrees a little bit. So what we're doing here, if you've never seen these kinds of things, is we're going to take the this data that we just showed you, right? These these records, and we are going to order them by window time. So this promises that we are going to be ordered by window time within the the range of of time that we're looking at here, and we are going to for each one of the price, min, max, and average we are going to look at the previous event. So if you think of them in sorted order, when we are looking at um, this event, the lag function is going to pull the values out of the previous record. In addition, it's gonna keep all the existing fields, right? So basically we're adding three new fields that capture the previous value. And we're sort of wrapping this. And so again, in this case, we're going to run this query. We say pipeline, whoops, pipeline preview. And we're going to run this query inclusive of the outer lag. And so again, 
we like this preview feature because I don't know how you can sort of like keep all these details otherwise in your head. And so like, this is how I personally build these kinds of complex SQL statements. We could have also built multiple pipelines that sort of did them in a sequence if we wanted, but this is more efficient, keeps it in sort of a single pipeline, it's relatively easy to do. So you can see that again, we're getting all the same fields, but now we have three new fields that are interesting. Um, let's take a look. So the first, record we get we have 45 46 is our window end where's our window start is 45 45 um, it triggered at 45 45 999 so it basically triggered right at the end of the window we can see that we have six events um, in our volume so like all this stuff looks normal we see our price min we have a minimum but our three new fields price max preview is null price average preview is null and price min preview uh, previous sorry is is null and that's because it's the first record there is no previous record uh, in the second record just for the sake of verification price max previous is 3866675 so our that should be identical to our price max 3866675. Yes, this is correct. So we now have the current value for the one second interval and we have the previous value for the one second interval. So we're basically keeping data for two windows as they're moving in time. Pretty cool, um, not as useful just yet. Our final select is going to keep all of those fields right it's going to continue to keep them and we're going to add three more fields which is the difference excuse me between the current value and the previous value and we're going to rename that change we're going to assign that sort of a, a, a dedicated con call change and in fact now that um i'm looking at the outermost query i can run I can run the preview sort of uh, within the within the application, and so now I should have three more fields that have um, the change amount. And so, like if you wanted to, for instance, build a process that measured volatility um, of a particular uh, financial product from you know traded on Coinbase, you could actually build that process you're gonna get a series of, of events and let's actually format these so they're a little bit easier to read. You're gonna get a series of events that are, whoops, that are, uh, and again, you see our nulls, that are uh, usable for um, certain kinds of, um, you know, uh, information that you might use for trading strategies and those kinds of things so i'm skipping the first event because it has some nulls in our second event you can see you know again we're we're at the 17th second um we have one transaction that's less exciting but um in our previous window we had 12 transactions and you can see the min you can see the max the average and now we can see that the min has risen by 4.88. The max on the other hand has dropped. So the window is compressed um, by 1.03. And then the average has risen by 1.2 and change. So um, it gives you some idea about some of the things that you can do uh, in a streaming context. And you'll see that this kind of goes on and on and on. Um, in this case, you can see that in general, things are rising. It's falling a little bit, it's rising, falling just a hair, but, but rising on the max, you know, on average has fallen. You get the idea here, this second, it's a more of a drop, you know, at these amounts, not a substantial drop, but still a drop. Um, and it gives you some idea of some of the stuff that you can do. Um, we could take this data and 
train a model or refit a model in real time by hanging it off of a Kafka topic or a Kinesis topic or something like that. We could write the results of this into something like S3 um, and query it with Athena or Postgres and you know allow like a data science team to have at it or Delta Lake or something like that inside of Databricks. There's lots of different ways that we can sort of take advantage of this data and we can compute even more complex stuff. The other cool thing is that because this is being written into this output stream, anybody who wants to use this can come by and take this one stream and rather than all of this garbage, you know, they can say, I just want to, I just want to look at the result of this query. And they don't have to remember sort of like all the details that go in uh, into computing this kind of data. So again, these streams act like tables in a data warehouse, right? This is the way in which we can share data between teams. I don't like invoking buzzwords, but if you are interested in like the concept of data meshes and data products, this would be one of the ways that a team could create a data product that anybody else within the organization could use and consume. They know where to find it because it's, you know, it's with all of the other streams. They know what data it contains. They can browse where it's coming from. In this case, we can see that no one's using the stream. So we also know that maybe we don't need it, you know, because it's not actually helping anybody. It's not serving any purpose. Um, but, um, you know, we could just as easily uh, write a, a pipeline that sort of consumes from this. And we can walk all the way backwards to know, okay, so this is what the aggregation looks like. It came from this, uh, this stream of cleanse transactions, which came from this Coinbase TX cleanse, which came from this REST connection, which was created by data PM. So we could sort of walk the lineage graph all the way backwards. Um, or for instance, maybe I'm the person who is responsible for this. And I say, you know, I, I'm sick of maintaining this. Is anybody really using this? And I know the answer is yes, someone that's using this. So we can sort of walk that dependency graph both ways, which winds up being sort of really important for, you know, for a bunch of things that I'm sure all of you uh, already know about. Um, if we made a mistake, we can sort of revert to a previous version. You know, um, you've seen the preview capabilities that we sort of have here. You can see some of the kinds of functions. There is a whole set of different kinds of functions that you can use. Um, some of which come from, you know, Apache Flink that we expose as part of Decodable. And then there's some additional functions, you know, things like probabilistic quantiles and those kinds of things that, that we expose. Um, that are that are part of decodable. I'll pause there. Uh, I feel like I've been sort of talking at everybody. Do folks have questions? What can I tell you about? Um, you know how we are doing this, or you know the, the underlying tech behind it. Uh, one question I have is: you mentioned like when you personally like to preview the data when you're building it, especially when building complex um, pipelines. So um, I just wanna correct my assumption here is that we can, we it does not require a sync connection or destination connection for you to preview one pipeline step to another. Is that correct? That, that's exactly correct. Yeah, so what we're actually doing when you click preview is we, we analyze and parse the query, and then we actually strip off the the output, and we basically steal the output and stream it back to the client, whether it's the CLI or the application. So you you do not need um, any kind of output. That's right. Great. And um, one thing I noticed is that when you were looking at your profile and your uh, your locations or cloud locations, this is mm -hmm. all on the developer account, right? So this is everything you're doing here can be done for free. Yeah, that's right. So if folks are interested, um, we have multiple tiers. 
of the product. So the developer account allows up to four tasks. When you start a pipeline or a connection, you tell us how many tasks you want. That's like the unit of parallelization. Um, and um, this is mostly enough to do about 500 gigs a day, give or take. You know, sometimes you can push it a little bit up to a terabyte, but you know, it depends on the processing you're doing. Um, and so this is free. Um, you can sign up right away. You don't need to talk to anybody in sales or anything like that. And then we have an on-demand tier and then we have an enterprise tier for sort of the people who want to pre-purchase capacity and get volume discounts and all that other kind of good stuff. Oh, and then I guess one one extension to that is the decodable CLI uh, free or I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the CLI, the API, so everything that I showed you here, none of this stuff is behind like any kind of paywall or anything like that. In fact, like I said, my account is actually on the free plan. So everything that I showed you here, you can do for free yourself. We don't restrict any of the functionality. That the only functionality that's gated behind like a, you know some of the higher tiers is integration with things like Active Directory, like, you know, authentication uh, stuff. So free, the, the developer accounts work with your pre-existing Google or GitHub account. So we basically just use social login to, to sign folks up. And then um, for connections, um, mm -hmm. is there kind of an aspect of like, you have your Slack community, but is there, um, like in terms of building destinations or sinks, um, is that something that uh, Decodable takes priority in doing or is that something that's open source to the community? Uh, yeah, so we, because we are a cloud service, we don't allow user to find code because there's no like safe way to run it for us. Um, I mean, there there are, but you know, we, we've chosen not to do that. So for a lot of these things, we have either written these or we have productized some of the open source uh, code either in Flink or some, some other projects that, that run under the hood there, um, uh, depending on the technology. And that's, that way we know, excuse me, that they just work. If there were something that you needed, you should just tell us and either it's already on our roadmap that we will do it. Or if it's something like really esoteric, that's like specific to you and it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to like productize it. The way we handle those things is we say like, well, why don't you use one of the messaging systems, Kafka, Kinesis, Pulsar, Red Panda, um, and build the connector on the other side of that topic. So like that's kind of our trap door for something that we that we don't support. And that allows you to do things like Lambda functions and Kubernetes containers of like custom code and like all sorts of other stuff that, that is managed on your side, which winds up being much, much, much easier and safer for both us and you. Um, so that's how we typically approach those things. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. Data PM is kind of interesting because it uses Decodable's APIs to be able to provision these kinds of objects, which gives you some idea about how you can effectively build this into part of a larger platform or product that you're building internally. Uh, so you're not necessarily beholden to our CLI or our interface or our full set of REST APIs. We have no private APIs. Everything you see here uh, is stuff that you can do yourself. I realize we're just about out of time. I just want to thank everybody for all the, the questions and for uh, Anant for, for hosting again, uh, for Travis and the Data PM community, uh, with, without which we would not have a good demo for, for crypto data. You know, so um, I strongly encourage everybody, you know, check out decodable.co, uh, dot, dot um, datapm.io, um, check out Anant. Uh, we are also hiring, I'd be remiss to say. So like, if you want to hack on server stream processing systems and, and data platforms, you know, we're, we're happy, to, happy to take folks as well. Awesome, thank you, Eric, this is great. Um, and I think if 
if we have more opportunity for in, in expanding on Decodable in the data engineering realm, we always welcome you back. Uh, if you have new things you want to show off, feel free to reach out to me as well. But again, if anyone has any topics that they would like to present a data engineer's lunch, feel free to let me know or drop a comment on the YouTube channel and we can get back to you. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Travis, for last week. Uh, if you want to check out part one of this series uh, with Data PM, uh, it's on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash noncorp. And don't forget to like and subscribe, as well as public announcement from here at Anant. We released our second Apache Cassandra runbook. We'll drop the link in the uh, YouTube chat as well as the Zoom chat. So if you want, you can go ahead and download it. It's free. Um, Let's go ahead and drop it here and then drop it in the YouTube chat and we will see everyone.